apologize for that. And uh, Dave will talk a little bit more about that as well. The other thing I would like to mention is that we are going to, uh, we do plan to take an aggressive look at the other possible, at other possible plan options that might be out there in the marketplace early next year. Start a little bit earlier, be a little bit more aggressive, and um, to take a look uh, to see if, uh, what other kind of plan options uh, might be available to us. So with that, I'm going to bring up Mr. David Johnson. Come on up. Thank you, Lori. <coughs> Excuse me, I apologize. I'm not fighting the cold. I am at war with it right now, so my voice is a little shaky. I apologize. Um, I thought I would just talk a little bit about both of the plans. Uh, first of all, on Dell, you may remember last year we made some minor changes to the plan, uh, changed uh, so that employees had a, a bigger discount of providers, to, excuse me, a bigger network of providers to go to with a bigger discount. Uh, claims increased slightly, but network discounts did too. So that just means they're able to use uh, providers that are giving them a better discount, giving them a better discount in any out-of-pocket expenses they might have. Um, <coughs> excuse me, we also changed the administrative fee last year, so we're in the middle of a two-year rate guarantee. Um, so the dental plan is rolling along fine. We're going to have the same rates for this coming year, so everything should be fine there. The medical plan is a little bit of a different matter. Um, you have seen, I think, in some of your communications that claims have increased quite a bit over the last year. I think the number is 27%. Um, probably the question you ask is, well, why have they gone up so much? And the response is, I was actually telling Lori this before the meeting, uh, it, it sounds like a cop-out, but you have done so well for so many years that this is a pretty standard increase. Your overall cost on the plan, your maximum obligation to Anthem is going to increase by 10%. If you don't incur the claims because the plan is self-funded, so you're essentially paying the claims, Anthem is writing the checks on your money. If you don't incur those claims, you keep that money. And that's what's happened for the last several years. Uh, three years ago, you had a 1.5% increase, I believe. Last year, you actually had a decrease in overall obligation. All along, John has set rates at more expected claims because your maximum is actually uh, much higher than what expected claims are. So right now, as of through <coughs> excuse me through September, your claims actually for the first nine months of the year are right where the insurance company expected them to be. They just happen to be higher than they have been for the last couple of years. You haven't changed plan designs for. I couldn't remember the last time actually you made a plan as I changed in terms of benefits on the plans. Um, you've got a about a 10% increase for the upcoming year. Um, again, the self-funded plan allows you to take advantage of any kind of uh, lower claims experience that you expect to have. So um, your large claims increased that this year. That was one of the things that did increase. So those big ticket items did increase quite a bit from last year. You also are looking at some of your claims experience. Your, your inpatient expenses actually decreased a little bit, even with those large claims. But your outpatient services actually increased a lot. And that means there are just a lot of visits that people are having and incurring expense there. So I'd be happy to answer any questions or go into any more detail that if you like I need to. <coughs> You have any questions? Right. It's a nature of business in the insurance business, that, especially with self-funded plans. You go along, and you know, uh, we were just talking to Mayor Jackson, and they had a, a big increase like this about three years ago, and it's been level the last couple of years. But you know, at some time, it's going to come back and bite you if you if you go along. And that it will. It's just the nature of the business. Uh, we are, as Lori mentioned, we are going to review the market next year. So that will involve looking at other vendors in terms of the providers that you would have available. Look at other vendors in terms of the internal stop loss insurance that you have. So you're protected over $150,000 on large claims. So we'll look at different vendors for the cost of that, different administrators. You have a unique plan today and that for both of the plans that you have, you have a, a traditional PPO plan and you have a qualified high deductible health care plan. 
both of those plans, an employee has a choice of which network of providers they want to use. So they can select a narrow network, and that is less expensive. It excludes several providers in Cape, but that plan is less expensive. And for that, actually, the city gives them well, extra cash. So and the rates are slightly lower. So <clears throat> when we review those things, that will be what we'll look at, where people are incurring claims to make sure either A, they have the same providers, or B, articulate how that's going to impact them if you decide to make that kind of a change. But we'll be doing that in 2020. How, how yeah, 24 21. How much of that 27% increase uh, is attributed to large claims? Probably about half of it. Um, you actually. So these are probably large, one time, acute claims, not ongoing. That's certainly what you hope for. But um, probably half of yours are ongoing, so there will be some expense next year okay. for those particular claims. Um, so for the rate, so so the insurance company uses a rating period, so 12 months, and that rating period was uh, August 1st of 18 through the end of July of 19. Uh, there were 14 claims over $25,000 in that time frame, four of those were over 50 and one of them was over $100,000. So the largest claim was 191. That sounds like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money, but there are a lot bigger claims out there that we deal with. So you're fortunate in that sense that it's not a $250,000, $300,000 claim or something like that. Uh, paid claims after stop loss, after we remove, after the insurance company removes the amount over the stop loss, are right at, or they were, 2.4 million. And <coughs> last year, a year ago, the insurance company said, as of this time frame, that's where you expect claims to be. But last year's claims were so much lower that it looks like a dramatic increase. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Question to Lori. And then, overall, are city employees happy with the plan that they have? Do you, do you get that feeling? I feel they are. Um, as David mentioned, we haven't made really any plan, cha uh, plan changes with deductibles, um, co-pays, and things like that for probably a little over 10 years. So, um, it's yeah, it is. It's been that's um, a uh, an accomplishment in the insurance world. I think not to have to look at some of those things sooner. And uh, when you look at over a 10 to 12 year period, um, you know, it's like the stock market. <laughs> It's a little different picture than when you just try to look at one year um, and what's what the results have been. But overall, um, for the most part, I I think the deductibles. Sometimes we do get um, people that come back and say the deductibles are a little high. What are they? Uh, the city made those changes uh, back when um, it were probably uh, it was a, it was a I guess a, a newer thing to raise them up that high, and, and it was painful then yeah. uh, to raise them to what they are now. But they haven't changed in, like I said, a little over 10 years. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what they did. Did you ask what they were? Did yeah, I hear that? Okay. So you have two plans. You, you really have four choices. So you have a traditional PPO plan, and you choose which network you want to use. If you choose to use the narrow network on the PPO plan, an employee gets $32 per month extra in their paycheck for selecting that plan for the PPO plan. So the city pays the, the full premium for the single and then they give back 32 bucks. If you're in the HSA plan, they get banned the narrow network, you get $29 back in cash. Now that's in addition to actually on the HSA plan, you're giving $50 a month to the employee to put in their HSA. That's their money immediately. So the first, you give it to them in the first month, that's their money, and it's in their HSA plan. They can spend it however they want. If they don't spend it the right way, they get taxed on it or yeah. or penalty tax, but that goes in there. So they get 600, is that right? 50 times 12, 600 bucks a year. The PPO plan is a $2,500 individual deductible. But the PPO plan, if you go to see a primary care physician, it's a $30 copay. If you go see a specialist, it's $60. So if you don't do anything all year long and you get to November, and you get a cold and you should be going to see the doctor for primary care, you're going to pay $30 even though you haven't spent any other money. So that's first dollar coverage. And the HSA plan or the qualified high deductible plan is a $2,000 deductible. 
So that everything goes toward the deductible except preventive care. So if you go into the doctor just again for that sinus infection or whatever, you're going to have to pay the full cost of that benefit. But you're getting that fifty dollars a month to help pay for those things. <coughs> I'd mentioned to say $2,500 deductible is low in today's market. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, it really is. Mm -hmm. uh, especially 100% employer funded. That is nice about the plan yeah. or a reduction for selecting sure. that narrow network. Yeah. Thank you. No, I, I disagree with the vision. I mean, insurance now is a difference a lot of times in getting and keeping quality employees. I see it. I know you see it. Um, so I kudos. I know it's tough to make a 27% increase, but we've been very fortunate over the last few years. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And you said you will be looking at yeah. and back in the marketplace. <coughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate being able to work with the city. We, we really thank you for being one of our clients. So thank, thank you very much. <clears throat> well, now we're going to do communication reports. Council? Yes. It's spaghetti day. Uh, make sure you turn your mic off. I got this on the phone. Turn them off. Turn them It's spaghetti day on Thursday. <laughs> Yes, it's a big deal, big deal. Um, the Park and Rec Foundation. Uh, which annual, what year is big deal? Oh, oh. No. Like, like 10 or 12. It's a, like, you've got it down with science, we'll put it that way. Um, <laughs> Thursday, 11 till 7 at the Arena Building. Um, dine in, carry out, or delivery. So, Kate does it right. Um, the delivery is big. The delivery is big. Uh, and I know the, the parks folks are scrambling around town like crazy to provide this wonderful benefit and wonderful spaghetti. So um, eight bucks for adults, five for kids. It's the deal of the week. So everybody have spaghetti on Thursday. Great. It's great. It's a great fundraiser too. So for a great cause. Great. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I do. Um, so. I'm sure you're going to talk about the NAACP reading plan. Well, I mean, I, you know, I, that was a, uh, had the opportunity to go to the dinner with uh, Nate and, and Mayor and Shelly. Uh, it's the first time I, I've been to it, and I really enjoyed it. And I won a, um, uh, a tea kettle and a silent auction, so, uh, uh, yeah, but it was a great, uh, the speaker was amazing. Uh, the musician was, uh, man, still Awesome. Yeah. Where, he from, where was he from? He came uh, from Baltimore. Bal uh, yeah, I mean, Baltimore. That's cool. it, was, it was amazing. Uh, and then last week, I had the opportunity to go to uh, an event. I know Chief Blair was there and uh, Assistant Chief Barnes. The um, Behavioral Health and Economics Network uh, of the National Council for Behavioral Health had an event showcasing the um, efforts locally of the crisis intervention teams. Uh, we had um, uh, state uh, legislators in the room, um, <coughs> staff from Senator Blunt's office, as well as Congressman Smith, uh, the sheriff, and as I said, um, uh, Chief and uh, Assistant Chief Barnes, and uh, a lot of the uh, behavioral health providers just really kind of uh, talking about all of the efforts now to uh, help out uh, uh, law enforcement and to work together with law enforcement to uh, respond appropriately um, uh, to to calls. I mean, I think for so long, the chief can probably speak better to this than I can. You know, um, I think I heard from a number of officers that were on the panel that uh, you know they, historically they had gone to a call and and you know uh, uh, responded and maybe uh, or you know put them in handcuffs, put them in the car, and took them and, and didn't really know what to do with the person who was in mental health crisis. And now that we have programs and staff available, we can divert them to the correct uh, place. Chief, if you want to say anything. I, I actually never miss an opportunity to say anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, 
one of the things that uh, I'm going to brag on our department a little bit. A few years ago, we took a pledge to try to get all of our officers with the crisis intervention training, and 95% uh, of our patrol officers are crisis intervention specialists, for lack of a better word. 75% uh, of our department across the board has gone through this training, and uh, we we can see a difference in in how our interactions go and how we're able to get people better services and get them to services quicker because we can write by, by no means are we psychologists or counselors now but we at least have some of the tools in our toolkit to recognize that and one of the things that really impressed me was there was a, a lady down from the national foundation um, from dc and she mentioned that missouri's crisis intervention program is the go-to that she tells other states to look at when they're wanting to put something together and so i think that's something that as missourians you know, we can all be proud of and i actually just said missourians and we uh, it's awesome. We, we have a very active, we have a very active uh, crisis intervention team council here in the southeast area. You know, we're lucky enough to have a state coordinator, uh, Detective Klaus from Perryville, who coordinates CIT efforts across the state. And he's a great resource. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it was it was a great event. Good. I'm gonna call Texas and let them know. <laughs> I guess I am fully assimilated now. <laughs> Mayor, uh, Stacy and I uh, got to meet uh, with Ryan and Alex and Molly on Thursday and go through um, the comprehensive plan overview. Um, and that will be presented, I think, in November? It will we'll take it to planning and zoning or probably PNC. late this year, early next year. Right. And once PNC adopts it, then we'll come forward to the council with a presentation. Oh, well, not uh, <laughs> But uh, that is something that I, I would, um, what I would, and Molly will fill in where I butcher this, but a, a, a strategic plan for uh, what the city is going to do, how we're going to do it with infrastructure and land use and, and those pieces. Um, Ryan Trimlin and I started on that 2016, I believe. So he's been working on that for three years, uh, four years now. Uh, phenomenal um, document and uh, much more user friendly to staff than the previous one. So uh, anxious for us all to uh, look at that. Molly, would you want to add anything? Yeah, I'll just uh, reiterate what Councilman Guard said that the comprehensive plan is really the city's blueprint for the future uh, for the next 20 years or so and it really does outline all of the things that uh, Bobby mentioned including our land use philosophy moving forward it will be the foundational document for the city council as you set policy in the years <coughs> and so um, we're really excited to get it adopted and present it to the city council and then start on those implementation measures we have made a real concerted effort to make it a living document so that it is a very useful tool uh, that staff can refer to uh, regularly when they present rezoning cases and land use issues to the city council, but also that you can refer to as you set policy uh, for the city's course moving forward. So very excited to share that with you in the coming months. That's all I've got, Mayor. Anybody else? Good. Uh, I too want to reiterate what you said about the NAACP banquet. It was a it was a really neat event. The music was outstanding. My wife loves it. Well, she runs it. A lot of her old students, right, Scott? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, it's a neat event. Uh, we had the Citizens Academy graduation this last week, and uh, that was kind of a neat event. We had, I thought, some great interaction between the people that were there and. Uh, Tried to take just a little time at the end to have a little question and answers about any topic, and and uh, it was it was a really neat event. It's it's progressing, and I think because of that, we're going to have many many more educated people out there in the community about how the city does business and what they do every day. And it's it's big. Thank all the departments for their their help in this. And, and uh, I recognize Nicolette. She's done a great job putting this together with help. Uh, it's she does a great job. Uh, <clears throat> I mentioned last time I I uh, 
my Mississippi River tour with the Missouri Department of Conservation was canceled, but I did get to go last Friday morning. And uh, for about three hours, we were out there with, uh, uh, there were about five of us, I guess, with the Conservation Department. Uh, it was a great trip. We went north all the way up toward Devil's Island and then all the way south uh, on the bridgeways past Missouri Dry Dock. And talked about all sorts of, of aspects of why the river is so important to not, not only Cape Girardeau, but the whole area uh, with navigation, with transportation, with commercial fishing, and, and uh, uh, Missouri Park of Conservation is really on the ball when it comes to what they do on the river and why they do it. Looking at uh, constantly maintaining what's, what's in the river and the cleanliness of the river. Uh, with various sensors they use up and down the river, even on barges and boats, they use those sensors now to take readings all up and down the river. Uh, the one thing that, that uh, we got to talking about was the Asian carp. We got up in Juden Creek, and we kind of got out of the way of a barge coming down the river, and uh, just to avoid the waves from the barge. And uh, he gets in there and does a few little circles, and next thing you know, the Asian carp are jumping everywhere, and people are kind of ducking. And, but we got talking about them, and, and I have. You now you think of the word carp and you think that's not really real edible. I mean, I've eaten carp by the Lake of the Ozark before and it's not really edible. Uh, but these are. And uh, in Japan they're considered a delicacy. Uh, they are, it's a, just a clean white fish, very, uh, very tasty, just, uh, it's, I kind of liken it to like halibut. And that's hard to believe. The halibut's a great fish. It's a lot better than the tilapia or some farm-raised fish. But in any event, they they would like to see uh, more local restaurants serving fish that's caught locally in the river and put it on the menu. Uh, at the same time, we're 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 going up and down the river. Uh, seems like we're constantly seeing these huge. Uh, pleasure boats that are moving, all moving south. And I don't know whether they're just moving, you know, they're moving south because of the winter, but uh, some of them are loopers, which they loop from, from uh, let's say, Mobile, they go all the way up the east coast and the St. Lawrence all the way, come into the Great Lakes, come down to Mississippi, and it takes them a year or two sometimes, depending on how they do it. But in the winter, they all head south somewhere. And there were like eight or nine of these boats that passed us in this three hours. And I kept thinking, you know, we had a some kind of a document or warning for something where they could stop here and get out and have lunch. And uh, it would be a neat deal. It would really help our tourism. And uh, I'm sure most of them went down and stopped at Kids Gas Stop because it's one of the only ones around. Uh, and I'm sure they're always glad to see them. But uh, I got to thinking about that. And I got to thinking about the NMRCTI meeting, uh, the talk of more and more river cruises that are occurring. There are three companies on the river starting in 2020 that are doing cruises up and down the river, uh, utilizing a lot of these low slung river cruise boats now instead of the great big river boat type boats. And uh, it would also give us an opportunity to, to have more documents for them here. So it's, it's something that we might want to consider part of our long-range downtown plan to to get something like that done. I know it's not easy when the river goes up 40, 45 feet in variation, but there, it can be done, and uh, it might be something to look at long-term. Anyway, it's a good trip. Uh, first Friday coffee this week, MoDOT gave a great update on transportation projects in the local area, uh, specifically about the Center Junction DDI project. He, stung around, he hung around afterwards to answer any questions or concerns people had. Uh, tomorrow we have a joint meeting with the school board, 11 o'clock at Osage Center, to review the uh, aquatic committee presentation and talk about what the two staffs can do together to address programming, to address operational costs, and all those things that need to come together to make this a reality. So. That's the beginning of a, a neat discussion. Uh, 
well, you already mentioned Spaghetti Day. Uh, Tuesday the 12th next week is the MML Regional Meeting in Scott City. Some of you have signed up for that. And Friday the 15th is the Zonta Club uh, Women's Achievement Lunch, which is a big deal every year. And uh, the Chamber of Commerce Annual Banquet's the 21st. So a lot of things going up this month before Thanksgiving. So that's about it, Scott. Stay busy. <laughs> um, just had a couple items. One of them, uh, staff is at ICMA. Uh, myself, uh, uh, Molly, and, and Victor were there. Um, uh, while Victor was there, our, uh, he uh, became a provincial manager. I don't know if that was a coincidence that it was the same time or, or, or not, but uh, he got his credentials as a city manager, and uh, that's an accomplishment we want to recognize. Thank you. Congratulations, Victor. Um, Holly had her first uh, meeting with uh, as, vi as a vice president for ICMA, and I got to do a lot of uh, a great uh, classes. Got to hear a lot of great speakers. I uh, went to a couple classes on the university, the town gown relationship, and, and there's some interesting things out there about that. And about, uh, there's actually a um, an association we may look at uh, try to see if we can become a part of. Uh, they have ideas of how how faculty and uh, cities can work together with students in order to uh, accomplish things uh, within the city. Uh, opportunity zones and the housing, I went to a great uh, uh, session on that. A lot about civil discourse and how it just continues to be a difficult thing to uh, people to just disagree and, and, uh, and do it right. And I'm, we're fortunate that here people can and do. Uh, disagree and we work out, and we and we come to a better solution. So uh, we're blessed uh, in that in that world. Um, I went to a design workshop uh, first out of there and got some ideas on how to work. Uh, do, use design workshopping to uh, improve processes. So I'll be able to use those skills in that way. So I'm going to pass those things along to you. And then uh, I know um, a couple of meetings ago we had a discussion on Tobacco 21 and um, uh, just uh, provided uh, some information. Um, uh, Chief Blair has talked with some of the cities that, uh, that have uh, this and how they go about doing their checks and uh, um, they basically uh, do theirs on a uh, complaint basis. They just don't have time to you know, every single place that sells it. Uh, on a regular basis, uh, so that's uh, kind of how we would proceed with that. Uh, and then uh, uh, Eric had some concerns about some of the uh, uh, ways the ordinance was the proposed ordinance was written, and so we have some concerns about that regarding uh, the fees were limited by the state as to how how much we can do fines. Uh, so there's a lot of those things that would have to be adjusted, then we have to adjust to our existing tobacco uh, ordinance. So uh, there would be more work to do, and I wanted to ask council if, because uh, I also had, had some input uh, from council members and others that uh, perhaps this, this is more of a state issue, that uh, if, you just, if you just do it here, then people are just going to go to the county here, or to Jackson. Hey, that was my case. Yeah. I'm not going to cut you off, but I, with with it being difficult, I mean, I feel like sometimes passing an ordinance that you, it's difficult to, or impossible to police is not, it's, it's not a good policy to have an ordinance that you can't enforce. And I, and I think if you really look at some of the stuff that, unfortunately, that we've got out of the hundreds of ordinances we've got, we can't police all the ones that we've got the way we should. And I really feel that this is a state issue uh, to me. That's just my opinion. I, I think that once they would, the state could pass it down to the county and and, and then to us. I think that that's to me that better set sets better with me. Um, you know, I, I look at a lot of the laws and different things that we put into place. It's to to protect people from people. This one kind of feels like we're trying to protect people from themselves. Adults. Um, so I, I'll just be with that. But I really think this is a state issue, and I, I commend Eli. I think that it's amazing that he's that he's done everything and put the work in. Um, 
I just think this is a state issue and this needs to go further up. Well, the other issue that is out there is that no matter what you do as a city with an ordinance, uh, they can still buy this stuff online. And there's no control over that. The city can't control what people buy online. The state can somewhat more than we can with a state law. Uh, but that's not going to prevent that at all. And uh, that's, you know, if you, if you outlaw it to people under 18, they can just get it online. That's not changing a thing. That's not. I think we can do a lot more with education. We can do a lot more with, with uh, you know, maybe just limiting the amount of uh, nicotine that's in that somehow. Because uh, that's the addictive component of it. But Eric made some good points that uh, in the you know, proposed uh, ordinance that we looked at with others, uh, sometimes the penalty amounts or in excess of what's permitted by Missouri law. Uh, it's uh, the presence of a uh, retail dealer and tobacco dealer is confusing. It, it can be inconsistent. And you're, you're limiting what a, a so-called vape shop can do, but yet the convenience store, you just walk in and it's there. Uh, there's just so many inconsistencies in the way it is right now. And the enforcement would really be tough. So I'm not sure it's something that at this point, until the state gets involved with it, until we can do something about online sales, uh, then it's something that we want staff to spend a lot of time on researching and, and spending time on. I don't think we need to throw our hands up and say this is a state issue. I, I think this is definitely something that we've got to wade into the water uh, of this kind of a discussion. Uh, if, if we punted things like this to the state, I mean, it can take years, and who knows what kind of technology will progress or how much more insidious the marketing gets and how much more this works its way into, into middle schools and high schools. Uh, I'd like to see the city of Cape take a stand. I'd like to see us proceed with this because it, it's an issue. This is a pervasive thing. And uh, I know it's difficult to, to, you know, to police and everything, but other communities have done the same. And so uh, anything, sometimes things are difficult, and we can still proceed with them. But I still think as, as, as it comes to then what we want to do, the discussion is, is that do we want to go down the road of, of doing it or not? I am to the fact that this is, we are talking about adults. And unless they want to change the, the definition of an adult at the state level and federal level, then, then let's talk. But we're talking about imposing rules and regulations on adults. They're 18 years old. Change the law. Change that law, and then let's attract this. That's, that's, that's over-governance. That's just over-governance. Well, I mean, by that, by that logic, anything that would, for any type of rule or, or anything that you put into place would be over-governance. I mean, we've got to look at the health and the futures of these kids. And we've got to make sure that we're, we're thinking about this from a community standpoint. I, I know it's tough. I know it's not popular. 